Road Razorback fans, I know you're pretty much sick of hearing about it, but I learned a lot from the NIL at the University of Arkansas, a lot more than any of us ever would have realized. And so we're going to talk about some of the findings that I had, as well as Arkansas football going after some wide receivers. Got a big commitment over the week. I'm looking for another one this weekend. And also the Razorback basketball team heading on the road to take on Vandy to end their skid in SEC play. It's all coming up on today's Locked on Razorbacks podcast. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors. I am also the host of Out of Bounds. You can catch every weekday afternoon from 1 to 4 on 103.7 The Buzz and 1037thebuzz.com. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Head over to Bet Online where the game starts. Hope everybody's having a wonderful Friday, getting ready into the weekend of sports. And I know that, uh, of course, Razorback basketball is in full swing, and I know we'll talk about it. But I wanted to do this podcast where there's not really anything major going on at this point in time to get it out of the way and to talk about it, because I think some of you are probably so sick of hearing about NIL or, or anything like that. And to be honest, I am too. I, I'm I hate the fact that it's become what it is. We all know that. But there is some things, though, that I feel like need to be discussed and talked about here on this podcast, at least, because I had the opportunity. And I'm not going to mention names because I don't even know if they want me mentioning names. It's not like it's that secretive, but uh, just to be on the safer side. I personally met with uh, some individuals and one particular individual up at the University of Arkansas dealing with NIL and somebody who is not only in the know of NIL, but what is going on, what's not going on, what's legal, what's not legal, the the things that are going well, the things that are needing work, and not necessarily just from the University of Arkansas perspective, but also just from college sports in general, dealing with the NIL that so many other schools are dealing with. And I really appreciate him. Uh, meeting with me and, and giving me a lot more info on stuff that I wasn't too sure about. Because when I would bring up NIL, it was just stuff that I heard. It was stuff that I thought from just putting some pieces together. Uh, a lot of those things. And in this particular case, I felt like it was it was perfect to uh, learn a lot more about it and to get an idea of some of the stuff that goes on at the University of Arkansas. And a lot of misconceptions, which I think that those are the most most important things to talk about. So let's start with that. Let's start with some of the misconceptions that so many of us had about NIL, specifically dealing with the University of Arkansas. Uh, it's not something to where it's simply where there's some, you know, big time donors that are working behind the scenes and signing some guys, whether it's out of the portal or recruiting or anything like that, to sign them on and pay them a bunch of money and they don't have to do anything. And that's not the point of it all. And I don't think that that's what's going on at the University of Arkansas. Maybe going on at some places, but we'll talk about some of the problems that arise from those places that end up doing it that way. But it's not just as simple as like, here, here's just this slush fund of money that we're just going to throw at all these players and we're going to pick and choose the ones we want. And then we'll just move on from that where, you know, they don't have to deal with anything. They don't have to make anything happen that we just pay them to be here again, maybe happening elsewhere, but at least at the university of Arkansas, that's not the case. What is happening though, is that there are so many opportunities for student athletes to be able to do these things themselves where they're not necessarily needing. And this, again, that's not every athlete, but there's a lot of, there's a few athletes that don't need the U of a to go out and sell this particular player. It will be the actual brands and businesses whether it's locally or nationally, that reach out to the individual athlete and say, hey, we want to sign you on for this. So those few individuals that can actually get away with things like that. Like, for instance, KJ Jefferson, without question, is the number one marketer or at least the number one marketing option for the university when it comes to their student athletes uh, across the board. It's something to where they don't need the U of A to go out there and find him things. People are coming to him because he is the big man on campus. Everyone loves KJ, and he understands that. He knows that, and he appreciates that. And that's one of uh, the many reasons why 
Uh, not only does he love playing at the University of Arkansas, love playing for Sam Pittman, love being a Razorback, but that's why he wasn't going to go anywhere to begin with because being a major athlete, especially QB1 at the University of Arkansas, goes a lot further and a lot further of a way than just simply being a one-year quarterback player you know, that gets plugged in at some other school to where nobody remembers you, nobody cares about you. They're just trying to put you in a position because you're really good. Like some of those players understand that. K.J. Jefferson is definitely one of those people that understands that. And so he's one of those players that benefits a lot from it just from being him. Uh, there, there's a few other ones. I know that uh, in basketball, you think about like, you know, Anthony Black, Nick Smith, some of the high-end players there. Rocket Sanders is another one too uh, that does a really good job with it. But there's a lot of various other players that are able to benefit from it. And the misconception that comes in from sometimes from some of the players is that they're like, okay, well, I, I see, uh, you know, KJ Jefferson getting these NIL opportunities. Where's mine? Where's my cut? I want that. And they're running into the issue where it's like, well, you're not KJ Jefferson. Or, you know, you're just going, you're just trying what they're, a lot of these kids are trying to do in some cases. Again, I'm just saying, in generally speaking, they just want to go out and get this the biggest money deals for the least amount of work. And that's it. But there's not a lot of businesses that are going to go for that, for one, especially local businesses that don't have that type of cachet to just go out and, hey, here's $500,000 to do nothing. Like, that's just not realistic. So some of these players just don't want to do some of the things that will just give them some NIL opportunities here and there. Small things, easy things. You know, like I talk about on 103.7 The Buzz, we have student athletes that come on our radio shows once a week for 15 minutes at the most, and we set them up with an NIL deal because it's a sponsored deal. I think they get paid, uh, you know, a little over $100, $125, something like that. But, you know, there's just something simple where, yeah, that's not big money. That's not something that's going to be changing their entire lives. But if you do enough of those little things that don't take a whole lot of work or effort, because let's be honest, I mean, talking on the radio on a phone for 10 to 15 minutes isn't exactly strenuous. And then those was, that's where it all adds up to where all well, these players start making money. So the misconception that some athletes may have is that, oh, I just, you know, I'm going to get those big money things. And there's really no schools, at least for the majority speaking, that are just doing that. They're not. Now, I mean, you know, people bring up the whole Texas A&M, like Miami or Auburn. There may be some schools that are doing that, for, but for the most part, they're doing it in a way of, you know, what was kind of intended, but also putting them to where, they may not have the one company that gives them so much money, but all these little things end up stacking up and adding up. And it's not just about money either. In a lot of cases, it can be just about uh, sort, certain gifts or whatnot. Something as simple as maybe there's a restaurant that's in local uh, Northwest Arkansas that wants to say, hey, you know, we'll get you this free food or whatever you want. You know, they can do that. Uh, there's some places that have even offered for people that really like cars or likes to drive cars. Hey, you know, we can have you test drive some cars and hang out with them like and, you know, kind of maybe get you some sort of good deal if you ever end up buying it, which kind of puts it into another perspective, which for for those big money things, it's like, OK, well, hey, there's this car dealership over here that's wanting to do something with you. OK, well, I don't want cash. I want a brand new car. I want a brand new car. That's what I want. OK, so dealership may set them up with that. But the problem comes like to a head because wait, 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 what's this taxes thing that I owe? Why do I have to pay that? Well, somebody's got to pay for it and it's your vehicle. So that's caused some things where some of these student athletes have to understand that that's what's going on too. Like there is a responsibility that's on them to, hey, it's important to make sure that you're doing things that you care about and that you're passionate about, but also know that there may be some things that you're going to have to do in additional, like that you're going to have to be understanding of. It's like, you can't just do the bare minimum, sit back and let somebody else handle it all for you. But that's what you've also seen with some of these student athletes. Like I think Cam Little's a great example. If you've looked at some of maybe some of the NIL stuff he's done, it's stuff that he's passionate about, stuff that he cares about, because there may be some things out there to where athletes, you know, it may get signed on at a bank and it's like, okay, so who's, who's passionate about a bank? What student athletes passionate about the bank? They, they may be appreciative of, you know, the money that they give and everything. I'm not hating on banks, but I'm just saying like 18, 19, 20 year old kids are not going to be, speaking passionately about banks, but maybe they do about cars. Maybe they do about, uh, you know, good causes going towards kids, you know, boys and girls club type stuff. 
maybe uh, towards uh, diet, exercise, strength training, something like that, a gym. You know, there's things that they have to be passionate about that they can surround themselves with that they also go out there as well. So there's just a lot more into it than just, hey, come on, here's your money, go play, be great. There's so much behind the scenes things that are going on there. And specifically, I know some of the stuff that's been brought up is about players that are getting tampered with. And, you know, a lot of players that like for Arkansas specifically this year who had some players that left the transfer, uh, got into the transfer portal. And a lot of us were saying, what gives what's going on has to be tampering, has to be NIL, has to be something like that. Or if you're, you know, someone who doesn't like Sam Pittman and like the coaching staff, you're like, oh, well, they're losing the team. You know, it was kind of just the one or the other. There's even coaches out there. Like I saw Brett Bielma tweet out a thing where they lost a commitment to Auburn. And he like say, hey, this is the thing about NIL. And, and then, of course, he, I think he had to apologize or something like that. But still, it's like, OK, maybe. But there are actually a lot more factors that do go into this because there's not many schools. Be like, be honest, folks. You know, so we'll just use the uh, the whole example of Jordan Dominic. Jordan Dominic has nothing to do with NIL. I'm so I'm, you know, but I'm just saying when he, someone like that, a player like that enters into the portal. I mean, how many schools do you think are giving Jordan Dominic big money to come and play for them? And, and even so, like, I mean, how much are we talking? How much is he valued at? That's not always the case. Again, it may be in some cases. Like, I still, I'd still believe now KJ Jefferson was contacted by people. But there's a lot of people that aren't that you think that just get into the portal like, oh, it's NIL. Like Jalen Catalan, a lot of people said you've seen, seen him go to Texas has to do with NIL. It doesn't. It doesn't have to do with NIL. I, in fact, like Trey Knox was one that people thought that maybe that like a, from that shocking standpoint, a lot of the staff thought that he was just going to go to the NFL. They thought that the only option he had was either coming back or going to the NFL. So when he left to go to South Carolina, it was pretty surprising to some. Uh, Keetron Jackson, that, that wasn't an NIL type of thing. I mean, if you start thinking about him getting closer to home and also uh, he kind of wanted to be the man from my from uh, from what I understand and just wanting to be the num wide receiver number one, the go-to guy, which is fine, which is fine. And he didn't get that this past year at Arkansas, so he wanted to make a change. Um, so again, all these players that ended up leaving, transferring out, uh, in a lot of cases that may have been assumed or thought about with NIL, that wasn't it. It wasn't it. And in fact, if you see some of these players to the schools they either ended up at or are still waiting, it kind of tells you that, I mean, you think Baylor's putting out, backing up the money truck for Keetron Jackson? You know, like, I mean, Jalen Catalan, he might, he might have like maybe got some opportunities, but still from what I understand, what I've heard, that has nothing to do with it. But then you got Miles Slusher going to Louisville. I mean, are they, are they backing up the money truck to get Miles Slusher? No, they're not doing these things. There's a lot more that goes into it. And then there's a lot of players that haven't even gone or committed to other big schools that are still in the portal that obviously the, it's not an NIL thing because they're not getting those opportunities. So I just learned a lot from this. And I'm, again, I'm appreciative of the U of A and, and allowing me to do this and to meet with them and, and all of that. Now, some of you may believe, oh, well, of course, they're going to tell you those things. You're not going to say that they're doing anything wrong or that there's any wrongdoing going on. They just tell you that. Well, here's the thing. Uh, there were some of the things that uh, we discussed off record that, of course, I can't say on the record. But because of those discussions we had off the record is why I believe of everything that they told me and the honesty that they provided with me to know that it's not it's not a thing to where you it, it, like it's not a thing to where each and every situation is based in NIL. And a lot of cases, even like thinking about these big schools that are around that are just throwing in IL, they're losing their behind on it where people are stopped and stopped doing it after a year. They're not putting in much money. Like I saw the deal with that four or five star quarterback at a high school that was, that was committed to Florida, but demanded that now he gets out of his national letter of intent because the $6 million NIL deal or something like that with Florida fell through. So he doesn't want it anymore. That's the type of stuff that's happening where, yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll get you this money, but then it doesn't actually happen. Miami, I feel, uh, you know, there may be a school that's been dealing with that. Some players, A&M may be some teams that have been dealing. Like the ones that you feel like have a lot of NIL and they're very braggadocious about the NIL. I hear and I feel and I understand that those are some of the issues that happen. Where, I mean, if you're if you're somebody that's putting up, a you know, a million dollars for a player and suddenly 
that player gets there and they're not as good. The team's not as good. They're not as marketable. They're not doing some stuff. Are you going to be the type that as a smart business person, the next year just be like, all right, well, here's another million dollars for somebody else. No, you're probably gonna be like, this was dumb. Why did I just waste a million dollars? So it's, it's a, it's a wild west thing. There's a lot of, um, issues that are going on that hopefully get fixed here soon. But again, I, I just thought it was something that needed to be cleared up a lot on some of the things that people think. And I was one of them. I was one of the ones that thought that some of these things were going on and they weren't. It's a much more, it's not as big of an issue as far as what's going on with everybody leaving into the portal with an IL. Like it's not that. Sometimes it's just a player doesn't want to play up north. They want to play somewhere warm. Sometimes it's just a player that had the coaching change and wanted to go somewhere else. Sometimes it's just something where they want to start instead of being a backup. So they go somewhere else. And that was something that I feel like, okay, I need to learn. I need to understand too. I understand that's not always in IL. Sometimes it's a little bit different from that too. But again, really interesting stuff. Really interesting stuff. And I thought that, uh, you know, with what all the misconceptions about, I thought that it's hopefully something that can be uh, put to rest. And it's uh, it's a deal to where Arkansas is doing just fine. Let me tell you that too. Arkansas is doing just fine with NIL. They got a great program dealing with NIL for student athletes. And it's not at all a problem. I'm just telling you right now, it's not at all a problem. So, well, we went really long on that. So I know we're going to have to scoot through the rest of the podcast. But uh, I got to tell you, though, folks, about betonline.net being your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get all the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football to basketball to World Cup. They've got it all at Bet Online. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at Bet Online as well. They're the fastest and easiest way to get on all of your sports betting info. So head to the website or use your mobile device to learn more over at Bet Online, where the game starts. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so moving on to the next segment of the Locked On Razorbacks podcast, dealing with uh, some portal news for Arkansas, and this happened a, a few days ago, uh, so uh, I wanted to like clarify and talk about this because we haven't had a chance to do it so far this year, but Arkansas did get a very highly coveted wide receiver out of the transfer portal. His name is Isaac Tesla. I'm going to call him Tesla. I mean, it was a guy we talked about earlier. I want to call him Tesla. It's probably not right, but if you're if it's spelled T little E capital S L A A, I want to say it's Tesla, but it's probably not. But either way, uh, Kenny Guyton and as well as Sam Pittman and everybody were really excited about getting him. He was 6'4, 210 pounds, and he was actually one of the most sought after wide receivers in the transfer portal, where he's coming from Hillsdale, Michigan, Michigan College. And uh, being the great Midwest at athletic conferences, top offensive player. Cause so people see the school and they see where he's come from. Like, ah, oh, how can he play in the sec? Well, the fact that he had uh, offers from Arkansas, A&M, Ole Miss, Arizona, Nebraska, Iowa, Oklahoma state, Iowa state, Miami, Wisconsin, Baylor, Colorado, and Purdue tells me a little bit about it. It's not just something to where Arkansas is taking a risk on some low level player. You had a lot of big time schools that really, really wanted him there and uh tesla even said that it just felt like home for me in his visit says people say sometimes that during a college visit if uh say that but i felt like i got a great feeling when i was down there at arkansas so he made the decision he says it was a difficult decision and he's gonna have two years of eligibility remaining uh when it comes to uh what he's gonna be doing at arkansas so uh but yeah so some good stuff there and a good a good get for arkansas and uh getting tesla because they need some wide receivers and in fact if you look at you know what's going on this weekend too, they actually have another big business according to Hogsports.com. Arkansas is hosting Bowling Green transfer wide receiver Tyrone Broden. Now he's 6'7, 210 pounds. 6'7, 210 pounds. He began his official visit with Arkansas uh, today and has already made trips to Oklahoma and Penn State. So this is a quarterback that has offers to Oklahoma and Penn State, two big time schools as well as Arkansas. So uh, uh, apparently it was it was expected to decide earlier this week that Oklahoma was looking like the most likely destination, but things changed, and now he's given Arkansas uh, a reason to give him a good look. He has two years of eligibility remaining as well, 
had uh, 30, 32 catches for 506 yards, seven touchdowns. And uh, also, uh, he's a, th a third year player there, too. So you got Andrew Armstrong from Texas A&M Commerce. You got Isaac Tesla from Hillsdale College. Both of those were highly sought after. And this guy, uh, if they're able to get Tyrone Broden, he's going to be a huge get, uh, literally, uh, for how big he is for the Razorbacks. So you're talking about a couple, uh, three wide receivers that you'll be able to add into the mix immediately that could be some impact players immediately and really help out K.J. Jefferson. I love the fact that Arkansas is going so big with their wide receivers because, you know, you think about uh, – Andrew Armstrong, the one that originally got out of the portal, he's at 6'4", right? So you got him, you got Tesla, who's at 6'4", and then you got this guy who's at 6'7". So you're, you see the type of wide receivers that they're wanting. They want big targets, big dudes to go out there and uh, have some deep ball threats, but also be able to make some really big catches as well. So they're really hitting uh, after the uh, wide receiver group, and rightfully so. We know it's an important position. And like I said last week on the podcast, or maybe it was earlier this week, get them all mixed up. Uh, but like one of the things I said is that they need uh, wide receivers more so than anything because wide receiver is the one position or at least one of very few positions that at this point in time will not be just as good, if not better, next year. You know, we know quarterback, running back, tight end are all going to be just as good, if not better. Offensive line, I think, was going to be just as good. I think D-line is going to be just as good. Linebacker, we'll see. Could be just as good, could be better, but Drew Sanders was a huge loss. Safety's already much improved. Cornerback's going to be much improved. So wide receivers, are these three guys, if they get Broden, is he going to be the one? Is he going to be the guys and those three guys making the wide receiver group incredible? Don't know. Maybe. But I think that you at least have some options there and you at least have guys that you feel really good about adding into the mix and seeing if what they can do once they get on the field. So... Big weekend for Arkansas. They're continuing to get after it in the wide receiver group, and we'll see if they can take care of business and adding him to the mix because there's a lot left in the portal season, but Sam Pittman and his staff are doing a really good job at this point in time. Now, we'll take our final break. We'll come back. We'll talk a little Arkansas Vanderbilt basketball in Nashville here on the Locked on Razorbacks podcast. You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so final segment here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Uh, talking about Arkansas basketball. You know that they lost to Alabama at home. They're going to try to get back on the winning track as they go to Vanderbilt, uh, a team that is not too great. Uh, uh, Vanderbilt's 8-8 eight and eight on the season. They're 1-2 in conference play. They're one win coming against South Carolina at home where uh, they went to overtime to take care of business in that game. But Missouri has recently lost to, uh, or excuse me, Vanderbilt recently lost to Missouri on the road and Tennessee on the road. And they actually played a pretty good game against Tennessee. They only lost by nine points. So uh, they're definitely capable. And this is definitely a game that Arkansas, you got to win these. Like these are the ones you got to win. Vanderbilt's not great. In fact, if you look at just the stats, Arkansas has them beat essentially in every stat as far as they, Arkansas has more points per game. They allow a lot less points per game. Their field goal, Arkansas's field goal percentage is five percentage points higher. They're about the same in rebounding, but Arkansas has more assists. Blocks are about the same and steals significantly more for the Razorbacks. So this should be a game Arkansas takes care of business and wins. It's as simple as that. Uh, Arkansas has yet to win a true road game. They've only played two, and both of them did not go well with LSU and Auburn, as we all know. But with the rest of the schedule setting up, and you know, we talked about how it's a little bit easier going forward. Beating Vanderbilt on the road has got to be one that you have to win. You have to win it. You're on the road to Missouri, and Missouri's good, but you still should win that one. Ole Miss at home and LSU at home, you should win those. So, like, honestly, you should win the next four. You should. You're good enough. You're better than the teams that you're going to be facing the next four games. I know it's easier said than done, but you should. And as we've talked about, if you just win these next four, and, uh, you know, you go on the road to Baylor, we'll see what happens there. And then, you know, you got uh, A&M finishing out the month of January at home, which you still should win. I know uh, A&M's looking better since they're 3-0, and which I know everyone's freaking out and saying, oh, how amazing they are. I was like, okay, we'll pump the brakes. They beat Florida by three, LSU by, what was it? Like, they beat LSU pretty handily at home by 13, and then they beat Missouri handedly. But it's like, let's see let's see what they do. Because, like, here's the thing. They go to South Carolina, easy. Florida at home, easy. At Kentucky, who's not good. They play at Auburn. So that's probably going to be their biggest test. Like, I, like they got they got some pretty easy schedules as far as the, some of these SEC teams go, especially in the first part of it. Arkansas had the opposite, but 
uh, still, uh, they have it. Arkansas really has a good opportunity to try to make this a a really good matchup in a really good month of January, or at least to finish strong. And then in February, when I think we all believe and hope that Nick Smith will be a part of it, then they can really get going. But this game against Vanderbilt, you got to win. I, I want to see. I want to see. I want to see consistency. I want to see Anthony Black have that type of performance that we all know he's capable of. I want to see. Ricky Council find that consistency and be that aggressive player that gets to the foul line and makes some big time jump shots. I want to see Jordan Walsh find the offensive rhythm a little bit more. Um, and also, I want to see Jalen Graham play a little bit more. I want to see what he's got. I want to see what he's good. Uh, see if he can get the offense going too. See if he can build some confidence. And uh, maybe that can get going. But they, it, again, it's the defense I know will be fine. I know the defense is going to be fine against Vandy. I know that the rebounding is going to be good. Like I know all of that. It just simply comes down to can he hit shots? Can Arkansas hit shots? Can they hit layups? Can they hit their free throws? Can they hit threes when they're wide open? Can they do that? They've struggled with all those things, but if they can do that, I'll feel good about it. I feel confident about it, but Vanderbilt is a team that's going to want to take care of business and want to get at you, but you got to win this game on Saturday. It's going to be an earlier one on Saturday as well. Looking forward to Seeing that matchup and seeing that game, I think it's actually, uh, if you're just looking at uh, on the TV side of things, on ESPNU at 1 o'clock. So it will be a little bit of an earlier game, but still one that Arkansas should take care of business against Vanderbilt. Appreciate everybody listening in to the Locked on Razorbacks podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on Google Play. You can also get after me on Twitter at BuzzJohnNeighbors for any questions, comments, concerns that you may have. We'll keep it going from there. Same podcast time, same podcast channel on Monday afternoon. Have a great weekend, everybody. We will see you then.